You have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now the full test will begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, as the recording is not played twice. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 6. Good morning. My name is Mrs Davis. I was wondering if this is the place to ask about the summer sports camp. It is, madam. My name's Philip, and I can answer any questions you might have. I have a 12-year-old boy called Dominic, and he always gets bored in the summer holidays. I need to keep him busy. We have a group for 11 to 13 year olds, so that should be fine. Will Dominic be alright playing with boys a year older than him? Oh yes. We find that at that age group, the students haven't usually outgrown each other, so they can play sport together without any problems. So, who does the coaching of the sports? We are a very professional outfit. The management are all ex-sports professionals, and our instructors are usually sports science students. Are the students on their own with the children? No. They're always supervised by more experienced coaches. Everyone receives an enhanced police check for working with children, and we run our own training at the start of the summer. All our staff are ready and trained for groups of children. What if there are any injuries? All our instructors and coaches are qualified in first aid. There is also the hospital just round the corner if there's a bad injury. It's good to have that nearby, but we haven't had to go there yet. I know it's unlikely, but it's always possible with that many children running around playing sport. I quite agree. Now, I want to ask about clothing. I suppose I should make sure Dominic has warm clothing when he goes. Well, Dominic will be there all day, and the weather can be changeable. I'd advise you to make sure that Dominic has warm clothing and changes of clothing. Where will the children go if it rains? Is everything outside? Our location is next to Wentmount School, and we can use their sports complex when it rains. It's a big place, and as soon as there's any bad weather, we'll be inside. That's good to know. Now, what parts of the day will Dominic be at the sports camp? We have morning sessions, afternoon sessions, or Dominic can stay all day. What would you prefer? I think all day. He can make lots of new friends and tire himself out. What about lunch? You can send him with a packed lunch, or he can join in with the lunches we provide. What sort of food do you serve? There will be a basic starter, such as soup or salad, a solid and hot main course, and fruit for dessert. That sounds nice and healthy. Oh yes, it's a sports camp, and we feel that healthy food is all part of that. So, Dominic will only need clothing with him? Well, some sports need special equipment. For example, goalkeepers use gloves, and all players use shin pads. I expect Dominic will want to use his own. Yes, that's true. By the way... As Dominic's a young boy, it would be good for him to have some snacks with him for the mornings and afternoons. Okay, I'll make a note of that. By the way, I don't know the timings of the day. At what time does it all start and end? We start at 9.30am. We don't do it any earlier, as the children are on holiday, and it's nice for them to stay in bed a little longer than their normal school days. That's a good idea. At Dominic's age, children will stay in bed until midday if they get the chance. I have a son that age as well, so I know what you're talking about. The end of the morning session is at 12.30, and then we start again at 1.30. The afternoon session runs to 4.30. We ask that all children are picked up by 5 o'clock, as the instructors will need to get home as well. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 7 to 10. Now, I need to know some things about Dominic. What games does Dominic like playing? He likes all sports. He's quite good at cricket and swimming, but his preferred sport is football. OK, we do plenty of all those. Where do you swim? Wentmount School has both indoor and outdoor pools. We do lots of swimming, both for training and just for fun. It's a great way for the children to get fit and to have a good time. Now, does Dominic have any allergies or anything else we should know about? He's not allergic to anything. He has strong legs and he can run for ages. He was in hospital sick in December for appendicitis, but that has all cleared up now. 
One thing is that in the winter we went skiing and Dominic broke his arm. It's all healed now, but I think you should be aware of that. Thank you, I've made a note of that. Now, we need to know how Dominic will go home every evening. We have a duty of care to all the children who will be with us, and we need to know whether we have to look after them until someone comes, or whether they will be going home by themselves. The first week I'll pick him up, and then after that he can take the bus home. I expect by then he'll have lots of friends to travel with. Good, that will be in Dominic's notes. You can change your plans, of course. Just make sure you let us know, so we can make sure he's safe at the end of each day. I will. Now, the last thing is for you to fill out an application form. You can see the information about all the fees at the end there. Pay the fees by bank transfer and put the reference number in the appropriate box on the application form. What happens if the course is filled up by the time you get the form? Don't worry about that. I've reserved Dominic a place. Just call me on the phone number on the form if you change your mind so I can enrol someone else. I'll keep the place for you for two weeks. Can I give the form in by hand to you tomorrow? I'll be shopping near here then. That'll be fine. Just make sure the payment is done, as the reservation isn't secure until we receive that. Once we have the form, you'll get an email within a week to confirm everything. That is the end of section one. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will hear a radio programme with a policeman giving a talk on crime prevention. First you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully to the information talk and answer questions 11 to 15. Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to Radio Coastal. Following the amount of crime we've experienced in the local area recently, we've asked Police Constable Cameron Dawson to join us today and give us some advice on crime prevention. Good morning, Cameron. Good morning, Tracy. Thanks for having me here today. I'd like to give you some advice today on various crime possibilities that you might have the misfortune to experience. To start with, one common theft that the police has to deal with is that of bicycles. Bicycles can be some of the easiest vehicles for thieves and vandals to target, and they are easy to sell on to others, making them a relatively attractive source of money. There are various things you can do to safeguard your bicycle, such as locking it securely and doing this in a place where thieves will find it difficult to steal. Another thing that you can do is to take a clear colour picture of your bike and make a written record of its description, including any unique features. Then you can send this to the police, who can get it back to you if it's found. Another problem in today's society is robbery on the street. While the likelihood of this happening is small, you should be aware of what you can do to keep yourself and your property safe. First of all, if you have to walk alone at night, take extra care. Stay on roads that are well lit and relatively busy. It's important not to carry any important documents, credit cards or excess cash with you. And if you think you're being followed, cross the road or go into a shop. Tell them your fears and stay there until you're sure you're safe. Don't be afraid of knocking at someone's door in the street, either, and telling them your worries. Even if they don't let you in, thieves will be discouraged and probably leave the area. Next, I'd like to talk about cars. If you have a car, your vehicle will always be a target for thieves. It can take as little as 10 seconds for a thief to steal something from your car. But the good thing is that most vehicle crime is preventable. Make sure you remove everything from your vehicle and don't store anything in the back. A good way to safeguard your car is to develop a regular procedure so that you take your keys out of the car, close the windows and remove all belongings from it. Follow your procedure and your car will be as safe as it can be. 
We've had a rise in the number of cases of identity fraud recently. Thieves may do this in order to buy things in your name and leave you and your bank with the bill, and it can be very distressing and difficult to put right. Most cases of identity fraud can be avoided through some simple common sense precautions. First of all, if you've had your bank card stolen or compromised, make sure you contact your bank immediately to change everything. Sometimes thieves won't take away your wallet, but they'll make a note of the details. This will encourage you not to cancel the cards, but the thieves can buy things online with all the important details in their possession. Another way thieves get hold of your details is when you throw away sensitive materials such as bank statements or receipts. These papers often include information useful to thieves. Stop this by shredding all the papers you think might be sensitive before you throw them away. You now have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the information talk and answer questions 16 to 20. I'd now like to talk a little about cell phone theft, as this has been a problem for a few years now. Having your phone stolen is a hassle. It's not just the handset you lose, it's the numbers, messages and photos too. Cell phone thieves thrive on opportunity, so don't make it easy for them. Here are some simple things to consider to protect your cell phone from thieves, and they're all to do with being aware of your surroundings. First, take care in busy locations, which are popular places for pickpockets, especially if a cell phone is visible in an open bag or hanging out of a back pocket. Next, think about when you use your cell phone. Outside subway stations can be popular venues for snatch theft, as people instinctively get their cell phones out to check for a signal. Finally, don't leave your cell phone unattended in public places. You wouldn't leave your wallet unattended, but a surprising number of people leave their cell phone on the table while they go to order a drink or go to the restroom. Most cell phones have a range of security features that are intended to stop anyone else accessing and using them, should they be stolen. One good one is creating a straightforward PIN code that locks your handset. Another PIN feature is that you can set your cell phone to need a separate password or account ID to prevent thieves from simply resetting your cell phone to its factory setting and therefore resetting any codes or other security features you have set. Finally, many cell phones can be traced, wiped or locked remotely using another internet device. These features are useful but will only protect your cell phone if you switch them on. Check the user manual and find out how to do everything. Knowing how to identify your cell phone if it's stolen is important for getting it back. Each handset manufactured for use has a unique international mobile equipment identity number hardwired into it during the manufacturing process. Knowing this number will help the police identify your cell phone should it be stolen, as they'll need to know more than the brand and colour of your handset. Check the international mobile equipment identity number of your cell phone by checking with its manufacturer's guidelines which should be available on their website. That is the end of section two. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear two students giving a university presentation to their teacher. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Good morning. Are we all here? Good. In today's seminar, we're going to hear a presentation from two students. The schedule says it's Lisa and Patrick. Are you both ready? 
Yes, Professor Black, we're ready. Shall we begin? Yes, please, Lisa. Well, Patrick and I are going to talk about the flower industry in Kenya. The flower industry in Kenya? I didn't even know they had one there. Oh yes, Kenya's horticultural sector currently ranks as one of the economy's fastest growing industries, the third largest foreign exchange owner after tourism and tea. The industry has been growing every year. The industry rose 31% over the last five years, with total exports reaching 130,000 tonnes per annum. How did the industry begin there? It doesn't sound like a traditional Kenyan industry. No, the history of the export of fresh horticultural produce from Kenya dates back to the period before independence, when Kenya, then a British colony, was required to help out with the running of the budget for East Africa. After independence, the industry continued to thrive, with exports starting to go to Europe, and thus opening up the potential for Kenya in the export market. Is Kenya's climate particularly suitable for growing flowers? Yes. Although Kenya is on the equator, considerable differences in altitude allow a great variety of climactic conditions from the hot coastal plain up to the cool highlands. A temperate climate prevails above 1,500 metres, where daytime temperatures are from 22 to 30 degrees Celsius, and nighttime from 6 to 12 degrees Celsius. Rain days are restricted to 60 to 80 days, so there's excellent radiation most of the year, which is ideal for the year-round growing of quality flowers without the necessity of greenhouse conditions. Kenya has enjoyed economic advantages as well. Kenyan companies have long benefited from favourable exchange rates, making their costs in Kenyan shillings and US dollars relatively low. The Kenyans have also set up an excellent logistics infrastructure. Nairobi, the capital city, is a major hub and is very well served by major airlines and charter operators, giving easy air freight access to European markets and from there to the rest of the world. And labour and energy costs are low compared to other countries. A further advantage for Kenya is that the industry still pays no import duty when sending its flowers to Europe. How has the industry affected the ordinary people in Kenya? Pretty well. In the agricultural sector, floriculture in Kenya is the second largest foreign exchange earner, after tea, bringing in more than 250 million US dollars per annum. Of course, this doesn't all go to the man on the street, but it creates a lot of taxes that contribute to Kenya's public economy. The industry does employ a lot of ordinary people, though, with 50 to 70,000 people directly employed and more than 1.5 million indirectly employed. You now have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions 26 to 30. It seems like an ideal situation for Kenya, with no problematic areas. It's not perfect, and some years haven't been easy. For example, there have been problems with workforce disputes, which have not yet been wholly resolved. Some years as well have had problems, as high oil prices negatively affected transportation fees. There have also been years when, in spite of the excellent climate, there were heavy rains or extended drought, which negatively affected the size of the crop at those times. What about competition? Most competition comes from countries that, like Kenya, lie on or near the equator. The four leading global competitors in terms of export value are the Netherlands, Colombia, Ecuador and Ethiopia. These countries compete with each other on the same markets in Europe, Russia and North America, and competition is getting more tense every year. What's causing the increase in competition? It's partly due to stagnating demand, but it's also a result of the growing number of large flowered roses and the generally improving quality of the other country's products. Hasn't there been some criticism of the sustainability of the industry? Yes. Although things have improved, wages are significantly below a living wage, 
leaving workers and their families with limited or no disposable income. Finally, trade union membership is often discouraged and undermined. One of the biggest ongoing criticisms is about water usage. The water footprint of one rose flower is estimated to be 7 to 13 litres. The total virtual water export related to the removal of cut flowers from the area where the flowers have been grown has been colossal. The water leaves the country and the continent and it's not easily replaced. This has caused an observed decline in the levels of local lakes and a deterioration of the lake's biodiversity. There is also a problem with pollution in the large lakes that supply water for the industry. Initially, everyone blamed the large producers, but it seems that although the commercial farms around the lake have contributed to the decline in the lake level through water abstractions, both the commercial farms and the smallholder farms in the upper catchment are responsible for the lake pollution due to nutrient load. How can this be addressed? There have been calls for sustainable management of the basin through charging water at its full cost and other regulatory measures. But any change in prices has been resisted and there are a variety of political and tribal barriers to getting legislation passed and enforced. Are there any other downsides to the Kenyan flower industry? Yes, there have been some criticisms of outdated farm methods. However, more farms are increasingly looking into organic methods of pest control and those farms that have implemented water recycling and waste disposal systems have found that they are able to decrease overall costs in the long run. That is the end of section 3. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear a lecture on cotton. First you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Hello everyone. Today in this agriculture lecture, we're going to look at the background of one of our most important clothing materials in the United States, and that is cotton. No one knows exactly how old cotton is. Scientists searching caves in Mexico found bits of cotton and pieces of cotton cloth that proved to be at least 7,000 years old. They also found that the cotton itself was much like that grown in America today. The cotton belt spans the southern half of the United States, from Virginia to California. Cotton is grown in 17 states and is a major crop in 14. The cotton growing process begins with planting. Planting is accomplished with 6, 8, 10, or 12 row precision planters that place the seed at uniform depths and intervals. Young cotton seedlings emerge from the soil within a week or two after planting, depending on the temperature and moisture conditions. The growing process can be threatened in different ways. Cotton grows slowly in the spring and can be shaded out easily by weeds. If weeds begin to overpower the seedling cotton, drastic reductions in yield can result. Producers employ close cultivation, and planters place the cotton seed deep into moist soil, leaving weed seeds in high and dry soil. Herbicides control weeds between the rows. The cotton plant has evolved with numerous damaging insects, and these insects, if left unattended, would virtually eliminate the harvestable crop in most cotton-producing areas. Plants infested with the leaf-feeding insects are able to counteract somewhat by growing increased numbers of leaves. Many cotton-feeding insects, however, feed on the cotton itself. This reduces the yield and leads to delays in crop development, often into the frost or rainy season. Plant protection chemicals are often used to prevent devastating crop losses by insects. 
All plant protection methods used on plants in the U.S. are thoroughly evaluated by the Environmental Protection Agency to assure food safety and protection to humans, animals, and to the environment. Some plants are also improved by modern biotechnology, which causes the plants to be resistant to certain damaging worms. The cotton plant's root system is very efficient at seeking moisture and nutrients from the soil. From an economic standpoint, cotton's water use efficiency allows cotton to generate more revenue per gallon of water than any other major field crop. Most of the U.S. cotton acreage is grown only on rain moisture, but a trend towards supplemental irrigation to carry a field through drought has increased in acreage and helped stabilize yields. Harvesting is one of the final steps in the production of cotton crops. The crop must be harvested before weather can damage or completely ruin its quality and reduce yield. Cotton is harvested by machine in the U.S. beginning in July in South Texas and in October in more northern areas of the cotton growing area. Stripper harvesters, used chiefly in Texas and Oklahoma, have rollers or mechanical brushes that remove the whole cotton bud from the plant. In the rest of the cotton producing areas, spindle pickers are used. These cotton pickers pull the cotton from the open buds using revolving barbed spindles that entwine the fiber and release it after it has been separated. From the field, seed cotton moves to nearby gins for separation of lint and seed. The cotton then goes through dryers to reduce moisture content and then through cleaning equipment to remove foreign matter. Cotton is then moved to a warehouse for storage until it is shipped to a textile mill for use. Cotton is ready for sale after the quality parameters for each bale have been established. Growers usually sell their cotton to a local buyer or merchant after it's been ginned and baled, but if they decide against immediate sale, they can store. Since it is a non-perishable crop, cotton stored in a government-approved warehouse provides a secure basis for a monetary loan. An often overlooked component of the crop is the vast amount of cotton seed that is produced along with the fiber. Cotton is actually two crops, fiber and seed. Annual cottonseed production is about 6.5 billion tons. This seed is crushed, producing a high-grade salad oil and a rich protein feed for livestock. One key aspect of this growing process is the management of pests. The most common way of treating pests is by aerial disbursement of pesticides. A crop dusting plane flies low over the crops and sprays the cotton with the pesticides that are in a holding tank under each wing. A careful spraying schedule and pattern should be created, and the cotton farmer must therefore have very careful notes on sowing and growing information. The pesticides are squirted straight down from the spray nozzles on the plane. The angle is important. If the spray is sent forwards in the direction of the plane's flight, the droplets will become too fine and be carried away in the wind or in the slipstream of the plane. Some of the pesticides, of course, will hit the right crop, but some will be untouched. This creates further problems as the farmer will not know which areas are treated and which are not. Retreating may result in too much pesticide on an already treated area, but not retreating may affect crop yields. If the spray is sent backwards from the spray nozzles with regards to the direction of the plane's flight, the droplets will be too coarse, which will also create uneven results. A straight down release creates the optimum medium fine droplet spray. That is the end of section four. You will now have half a minute to check your answers.